<laughs> so, so David, we were, I just, um, I didn't introduce you yet because we were waiting for you. Um, I mentioned how this whole idea started because Angie had a long comment that was too involved to get into in a text conversation. And I asked if, she, if we could turn it into like a webinar or a bigger forum. And she said, yes. And so this is, here we are. And then she connected me up with you and I'm so excited because a lot of our community is really, really interested in this topic, which is, and this covers a lot, I wish I knew then what I know now, yeah. in particular, the client as consumer, things to know when retaining a lawyer slash attorney, depending on what part of the world we're in. So um, before, you know, people already know who Chris and I am, but how about Andrew, you introduce yourself briefly and then David, and I, by the way, I need to warn everybody, that you are dealing with four people that love to talk. So our challenge is gonna be like reining ourselves in. All right, but go ahead, Angie. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Lisa and Chris, for having me, first of all. And thanks, David, for joining us. When I made the call and said, hey, yes. Um, you know, this is uh, unfortunately a part of life that's not really fun. And, um, I'm just trying to navigate it through it all, uh, being a single parent, the one teenage girl, um, trying to do my part in raising her uh, in the world of, you know, things that are getting not you constantly. And um, I'm busy with that right now. Yeah. Well, thanks again. And then we're going to get into your whole background with your experience with finding, finding the right attorney. Yeah. Okay, David, how about you introduce yourself, too? Well, first of all, as you can see, I'm wearing orange. And in Canada, today is very significant. It's the first national day for truth and reconciliation, which honors the Indigenous survivors and children who disappeared from the residential school system. So this is in honor of them. And before I start, I'll do a land acknowledgement. The land that I'm situated on, uh, the Haldeman Tract, are the lands traditionally used by the Haudenosaunee Anishinaabe and neutral people. So I say that before I start because it's to honor the indig indigenous heritage uh, in Canada. I am a former practicing attorney who's starting to get back into the practice of law. Um, I became, towards the end of my practice, I became very acutely aware of, I didn't know what I didn't know, particularly when it came to domestic violence. So I, I immersed myself in research by no means am I an expert, but what it caused me to do was work with clients far better. And I kind of came up with the idea that the system probably won't change because lawyers and judges will change it. The system will change because we have educated consumers, educated clients that come in and, uh, and ask the right questions and demand, demand a difference that we know needs to happen. Yeah. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, that's the thing is like people think that it's out of their control, that everything's out of their control. And we have to recognize there are many things that are out of our control, but there are a number of things within the system that we can control. And so much depends upon our own awareness of what to expect. And I know one of the things, and also what to demand. Um, but I know one of the things that we talked about the other day during our meeting before this whole um, Instagram Live was that the takeaway we want people to have or the goal should be that people should feel more empowered and not end up wasting more time and money on, and energy, especially when it comes to choosing an attorney or choosing whether to stay with an attorney through these high conflict situations. And also, you know, you're coming out of this very difficult relationship. You don't want to put yourself, we say, coming out of the frying pan and into the fire. So you have to be really careful not to keep repeating the cycle that you had in your toxic relationship where you basically put blind trust in somebody, you know, and looked at them as an authority before they really earned that respect from you. So Angie, can you get into a little bit about what happened to you that first year when you were looking for an attorney? Well, if I break it down and you have to do your own diligence and recognize marriage, right? What's happening with your partner. See that you've exhausted all avenues to repair. Then you have oh, to wait a sec. Wait, Angie, I don't know if it's just me. Your volume is chopping in and out. Oh, yeah. 
Can you hear Maybe me now? Maybe go a little closer to the mic or something. Yeah, go a little bit closer to the mic. Can you hear me now? How's that? Yeah, it's like a little up and down. Oh, yeah. Really? Oh. Yeah. How about now? <laughs> it's a little choppy, but we can hear you a little better. Um, so you start from the beginning and then you start breaking it down. And, I, that, and that's what I started to do. I started talking about my name again, exhausted all avenues to repair it. And then you have to start seeing the signs on, you know, on the wall. And despite the fact that maybe the other side is not you have to do your own due diligence. So if someone had told me four years ago that I'd be sitting here talking to all of them about the process I had already started, I would have been like, what are you talking about? So when I exhausted all those apps, I started making calls to see what my options were, to strategize, to see what, you know, what do we do next? How do we make this better? It doesn't have to be horrible, but let's get some advice. So I, I, I did meet several uh, lawyers in the first year, and it wasn't that I didn't like what they did. Some of them didn't want the case. They didn't feel that it was a case suited for their firm. Some of them um, were saying, you know, and, and what I have to stress here is really know your marriage and know your partner in order to- Angie, sorry, the volume is still going. It, it's in and out. This? How's this? Like we can hear you. Keep, is try this it this way, like as close as you can get. <laughs> How's this? <laughs> but so far it's okay, it's just a little up, it's a little up and down, because everything you're saying, I'm like, I want everyone to make sure they hear every single word. Are we better? For the second, I'm, yeah, I'm, keep talking. I'm in my basement far away from my dog, who was a pretend wannabe guard dog, and will bark at everything, and my daughter's upstairs with an excruciating <laughs> knee pain, so I was trying to escape to the basement. This is better when you're, the closer you are, the, okay. the better the volume is, so go really close. Um, yeah, so I just started, you know, just getting advice, really. It wasn't like to get out there and say, hey, I'm going to get here first. It was about educating myself. I'm not a lawyer. I didn't go to law school. I don't know what the process is. And I started to do some research, and by do, by, I did that by interviewing various lawyers. It wasn't about not liking what I was hearing. What it, what it came back to and circled back to was that I knew my marriage at the ending point, and I think that's really key for people. It, wasn't, it was no longer the Disney marriage I had entered. I identified where we were at. And I think by doing that, I was able to go in and ask the questions, like um, ask them questions. This is my situation. These are the details I'm aware of. And how can you help me given the list I've given you? And are you able to help me with this? And it wasn't an easy task. So when I hear, I get heartbroken when I hear other women, this is why I'm kind of passionate about this cause, is I, the first, the first people that, the first call that people make are to their lawyer or to a lawyer. But we have no resource. We have no resources of better experts or professionals. How do we know they're going to defend us in the way that we're, we're meant to be defended? How do we know it's going to be fair? You don't have to go to war, but make it fair. And not everybody plays fair. So it, right. was, a whole, it was a whole learning curve about how to read, how to read the people that you were aligning yourself with, your situation. I guess what I'm trying to say is just know your case, know your life. It's going to be the be all and end all. Right. And it's going to last for a while. Yeah. How long, think, how long for you, Angie, so far? I'm in three and a half years. Almost right. Four. And still not done. No. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing we say to, to our people too, especially in the legal abuse support group is like, this is a marathon and it's going to take years. Doesn't always, but that you should prepare yourself that this is going to take years. Okay, so um, David, I wanted to talk a little bit about the dynamics of the relationship between the lawyer and the client, especially because you are a lawyer. And it was, I thought it was fascinating, talk, the four of us talking the other days about what, what we should reasonably expect in terms of how we feel about, you know, how the lawyer feels about us, what we can expect from the attorney. So you want to get into that a little bit? Well, I mean, I can certainly speak from my experience. And again, I practiced law. I started practicing in 1999. And the way that I practiced evolved over time. And how I handle clients, I, I mean, 
quite honestly, when people came into me in 1999, it was a beeline to court. So it was, you answer the questions that I'm asking you. I don't need the extraneous details. Because quite frankly, when it comes to the law school system, that's kind of how we were taught. It's an adversarial system. You're building your case. Um, it, that means that it, it's, it really, that I always say when I'm speaking that V is there for a reason. It's, it's not, I mean, it's meant to be victory, but it's one side versus another side. And that, so think about it that way, right from the start, it's being positioned that way. At the time I started practicing, I think mediation was out there, but wasn't, hadn't really caught hold uh, as much as it has now, uh, especially with the legislative changes in Canada. Uh, but collaborative law is, was an area that I really settled well into. And what I learned over time was... Uh-oh, is he frozen? He's paused. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> well, Angie, at least we could hear you much better. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. All right, David, I don't know if you could hear us, but you're, you're spinning. spinning. <laughs> His wheel is spinning. <laughs> I know. It's like, what I learned was commercial. <laughs> Where's the commercial break? Next week, we the cliffhanger. <laughs> I know. Oh, gosh. Oh, oh we no, got, we lost oh, him. Gone. He's okay. Me. <laughs> All right. Lisa, I have well, a feeling I'm going to be doing some editing here. <laughs> I, know. I know. Well, I said that we'd post it right on Instagram just after this, but let's see what happens. Okay. He's back in. Let me see. He should be here any second. If this works. Uh oh. Tom? Oh. He's. There, 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 there you are. You, you left us at a cliffhanger. I what, what I, I learned now. was, yeah. okay. <laughs> what did you learn? And, and so what I learned, and, and actually what I, I found that when people came in to see me, it, it was a teachable moment for me. And I would, the first thing I would say is put your watch away. Um, I started doing flat fee consultations because I knew that that person whether I thought it fit within neat legal issues or not, it didn't matter. That person needed to be able to have somebody bear witness to, to their story. The other thing I would say is, listen, guys, you should be interviewing me as much as I'm interviewing you right now. Um, so ask the questions. My expectation is there's a lot of good information out there. Prepare yourself. Do the research. You know what? You, I'll ask you the questions about where you got the information from, and we'll be able to sift through the good and the bad information. I'd be able to steer them in the direction uh, of where good information was, because oftentimes, you know, I would have somebody in Canada coming to me and saying, you know, I want alimony. Well, that automatically told me that their source, uh, if they had a source on it, their source came from the United States, because there are different definitions. But it's about, it, for me, it became about educate yourself. Educate yourself. I'm going to help educate you on the systems that I know of, legal system being one of them, the adversarial system, um, but also the other systems, you know, whether it's collaborative law, mediation. And the other thing was making sure that that person that's sitting before me, if there's another professional that should be involved, that we get that professional involved, as opposed to the lawyer, as I think we talked about the white knight syndrome that I often saw, the lawyers swooping in, they have to save the poor client from themselves, they have to save the client from the big bad other person, partner that they have, and it's admirable and it's noble to take that view, but ultimately this person has to be able to live beyond the decisions that are made. And, and I think we'll get into it a little later, but I, I'd love to get into the conversation about the movie Divorce Story and the different personalities of the lawyers that were in there, because I, I, I think it's, it, it's very apropos that, uh, you know, I did see those personalities, sometimes a blend of the different ones, but really what it came down to was I saw an opportunity for a person who was in a difficult situation to get some guidance from me, to get some guidance from other professionals that they might, uh, they might be able to utilize, but also empower them. 
So you use that word, I'll underscore that word, let's empower people who are in this situation to also help themselves because when the hurricane is gone or the tornado is gone and you know and i often said the justice system was like a hurricane will come in wreak all kinds of destruction who's left to pick up the pieces but the people that are there so if you're not giving them a foundation and i don't want to scare people off uh, the hurricane approach i often used because i found the justice system doesn't and i think the three of you can attest it's not necessarily a truth-seeking mission like we think it is. It's not a neat episode of Judge Judy where she says, you're a liar, and I find in your favor, and it's neatly wrapped up. It drags on and on and on, and people need to know that. It's not to say that going the justice system route is inappropriate. I think in a lot of cases it's necessary, but having a say in what that looks like is really important. So empowering people is... I, that's where I ended up, and, and when I get back into practice, I will pick that back up, that this is about empowering people that are before you. Yeah, I mean, I know we talked a lot about how when we come to an attorney, people like us who have been in these long-term relationships, usually victims of coercive control, you know, all kinds of emotional abuse, we're not at full capacity. So we're already in this weakened state and we have to make these huge decisions. So, um, you know, like you said, you can't just be this vulnerable victim, you know, but I think the lawyer also needs to recognize that. And um, one thing that, you, that we talked about too was how the client should be able to question the attorney. You know, not just in like, you said interview you, you interview me, but to come up with a strategy together, it should be more, I guess it depends on the situation, but more of a collaborative thing um, and the lawyer shouldn't completely run the case. Yeah, and you don't want to do that from a disrespectful perspective or point of view. They did go to law school. Uh, what I found in my journey is that not all are created equal in their profession. And that's across the board in any profession that we see today. Move that's closer, Angie, move closer. Yeah, <laughs> so in my experience, I found that not, not all, uh, let me start from the beginning. You don't want to disrespect these people. They went, they went to law school and they know the law. But how they practice it might not be, I don't want to say the most ethical, but everybody has different ways. Let's put it that way. And you have to find, it's almost like finding a marriage, a partner, whatever. It's got to, it's got, it's got to work. It's got to, it's got to be the right fit. Just like when you go to a job interview, it's the exact same thing, right? You start talking about yourself and the company and all that kind of stuff. So I... I don't believe all are created equal. And I believe that we see that across all professions, not just lawyers, not just mediators, not just therapists. It's, it's everybody. We all complain about teachers and cops and all that. So it's no different. But you want to be mindful and respectful that we did go to law school, but you should have an opinion, challenge them, but be respectful while you're doing that. Your lawyer will know within the first two minutes of your meeting they're reading you. They're going to know whether or not, holy crap, she's on the ball or mm, we got to really take over here. So they're going to, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to be able to assess you. Yeah. Angie, could you talk a little bit about like I'm, in the beginning, how you said um, during our meeting, you, you felt like you didn't, you, you didn't want to question, you know, and you, you felt like oh, this sort of loyalty. Yes. Can you get into that a little bit? Because yes. I think that's so important. I think a lot of us feel that way and don't even realize that we're doing it. Absolutely. I was, I'm a different person today because of what I know today, what I know now that I didn't know then. I was a wounded bird. I was in shock. No matter how prepared you think you are for this, the reality, and I can't imagine people who who are not prepared for, for this coming, it's still a shock. And then certain things come up in your case that even send you into a, a, a more tailspin. So I'm walking in, I've done my research for a year. Um, I'm pretty sure that after a whole year and several lawyers, this is the one because we're getting it. He understands everything about the case, but I still felt, 
I don't want to say ego. I don't want to say some people have legendary reputations. So automatically you just go into that submissive uh, area of I'm going to listen because mm. you're the expert and I, you know, um, but then what happens during your case is when you start to get notified of certain things and you're like, you know, I didn't go to law school, <laughs> but this doesn't make any sense. <laughs> that starts to happen and it's not any disrespect to them. So then there's stuff that, that like that, that happens. So voice your opinion, speak up, be very respectful always, but also know not to walk that path of coercive abusive behavior and patterns as well. Yeah, the NC, they, you know, they know the law. No, no, they I mean, if they're, if they're good, right? So you made that point. But nobody knows your ex as well as you know your ex, yeah. right? Your attorney doesn't know your ex. They, they just hear you saying, you know, I expect a difficult divorce or something like that. But you know, maybe at the beginning you don't, but you know how difficult it's going to be. But at what point, I mean, I, I'm, I, I don't want anything combative. I'm like, you know what, it is what it is. I'm an, it is, I'm an is, it is what it is kind of girl. And it's like, let's do this nicely. Let's do this peaceful. Like, can't we just do it? But yet there's other aspects of the case that like to be combative. And I know, David, you're going to touch on that because of the movie that we discussed. And it's like, you know, if you're going to come at me, because nobody's perfect and we all make mistakes, but at the end of the day, if you're a decent human being, and you're going to come at me with, with something, come at me with the truth, because it's, it's kind of it's hurtful <laughs> that you're going to come at me with lies, and it makes the whole process more difficult. What is that yeah. uh, term, vex uh, vexation? Vexatious litigation. It's like, what are you guys doing? Like, are you well, that's, a whole, that's like constant, you know, motion. In that's all a whole... fairness, I start to question, did you actually go to law school, Right. And, and that's not coming from a really bad, it's like, this isn't making any sense. And as much as I respect your degree, the logic has to come into this, no? You think? It's, it's tricky when you feel like, you know, your biggest ally, your attorney, then starts to become like someone that you're also having to prove yourself to or prove the truth, that, that's a problem. Yes, and, 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 I, and I think to a certain degree, you, you owe that to them, right? I'm a person of honesty and this, these are the facts. This is what I did or potentially I did or whatever. I'm going to tell you, I can't imagine people who going in, who are going in lying off the bat. I'm like, I can't live like that. So I, I, I respect that they need a certain amount of time to be able to trust you. And that makes sense because they need to know how to defend you, whether you're going in the honest route or not. But you know, it's, it's kind of like uh, after a certain amount of time, it shouldn't be, the entire duration of the case that you're still trying to prove your point, right? Because like I said, the communication, the emails, and the first two minutes that they probably met me, I know because they told me so, you know, you're on it. And I'm like, and that's what I, you'll always hear me say, never take your finger off the pulse. Oh, yes. <laughs> and yeah. also sit back and eat popcorn. <laughs> I, I saw an earlier comment from someone here who said I was the pop <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah now um so David you also had talked about as an attorney a little background with domestic violence and that there's no mandatory education for attorneys on domestic violence because we always go with like so many people in our community are like I gotta find a lawyer who knows about domestic violence I have to find someone with coercive control so that's kind of hard well, I, I, and so, you know, taking a step back and jumping off um, what Angie said, um, and Chris, you, people who come in know their case better than anybody else. And it's almost like there's that preparation that can go in. And I think this is where you guys can come in and, and where you can help uh, potential clients going in to see a lawyer is preparing them for asking what otherwise might be difficult questions that concern that you are challenging, I would always, I instinctively just disarm people and said, listen, you know what? Yeah, I have a legal education, but you know your situation better than I do. I'm going to ask questions. Nothing is, I'll, I'll communicate with you if something, you know, makes a factual difference or not, but just tell me your story and don't be afraid to share anything. And, 
setting up those expectations and those communications right from the start is something, you know, you would think that lawyers are master communicators, but they're not. <laughs> it's, there's a case and we know what we're doing. I used to do it. Mentally, you're ticking off boxes. Okay. She wants custody. Okay. No access. Okay. Spells of support, child support, division of property. You're ticking off those boxes and the tendency is because they don't teach you the art of questioning when you're in law school, they teach you the art of cross-examination, and I did very well at that, but questioning, asking open-ended questions, eliciting information, getting to the, the emotions, getting to the underlying interests. I mean, think of the iceberg. And, you know, if you're not asking the right questions, you're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And then there's the other 90% of the iceberg that's submerged, and you're never getting to it. And so, you know, asking those interest-based questions and elicit open-ended questions, eliciting the information, putting a person at ease that, you know what, doesn't matter what I say, this person is listening to me. My job also was to say, okay, I'm hearing that, you know, this is what you'd like, let's explore that a little further and setting the expectations. Again, I can't, especially in a litigation situation, I can't tell you how many times it became so frustrating, lawyers just running off and asking for everything, throwing it out, you know, the kitchen sink approach. We'll just ask for everything and then we'll sort it out. And guess what happens? They draft a document that, you know, that Angie sees and Angie says, holy crap, none of this is true. You know, and, and it's, it, it still is, that system is still very lawyer centric. I think a lot of, the systems and there's even mediation, you know, when you get into it and a mediator goes through the, the case and then a lawyer rips apart the agreement, not having been party to any of the, and again, these are things that, that we need to be aware of, but this is where the very informed client is going to be able to ask those questions and not just hide behind, um, well, somebody told me to do it, be an active participant in the decision making. And sometimes what needs to happen on the very front end is you do need to, you need to talk to somebody else, you know, whether it's the services that you and Chris, uh, Lisa provide um, to be able to, again, it's all about empowerment. And empowerment comes from very, you know, you want a lawyer that empowers, but before that you want people around you that empower. And those people, uh, I often say professionals because Oftentimes, the people around us that are closest to us have the most difficulty challenging our thought patterns and, and what we're seeing. They tend to be a little more, I call them the Greek chorus, um, a little more sycophantic. They want to support you. It's not coming from a bad place. They want to support you. But when you have professionals involved, the professionals, especially people with lived experience, I, I became so huge. I did a lot of work in human trafficking and I got so frustrated with the systems dictating how we're going to deal with human trafficking, but never talking to the victims of human trafficking about, and the same goes here. You know, I was asked to give a commentary on the changes to the provincial legislation in Ontario. I was also asked to give a commentary about the changes that had happened to the Divorce Act in Canada. And I say, talk to the, talking to me is great. I have one perspective. But talk to the experts in domestic violence, the, the Peter Jaffe's of the world and, and Margaret Drew in the United States, talk to those people. Talk to the people who have been victims of domestic violence as well. That, I mean, there's a whole, but we tend to take these hacks and life hacks that, well, we just want to take the shortest distance to get the answer, right? Yeah. So. And I apologize, Lisa. I know I didn't answer your questions. So no, that's okay. Push. Well, you know what? Let's let's get into. I mean, first of all, what you said about when you first meet a client, how you're disarming by saying, "Tell me your story," and sitting back and listening. I mean, what an awesome quality to have in an attorney. Because you think yeah. too, a lot of people who are just coming out of these relationships have not been able to tell anybody. I know I didn't want to talk yeah. to people in my family, yeah. you know, for a variety of reasons, which is another topic, but yeah. the lawyer is the first one they see who they really tell their story to. So just have somebody there who's like, it's okay. 
I'm not judging you, but tell me what's going on a little bit, yeah. not feeling rushed. That's, that's huge. So, um, and I know we're going to get a little, I, I want to wait to get into how you should feel with your attorney, but I want to get to the questions to ask the attorney or lawyer when you first meet, because I know a lot of people are like with their pen ready, like, what are the questions to ask though? Like, what should I know? So I listed a bunch that we talked about the other day. Um, who wants to, who remembers or who wants to take a look at that? <laughs> I know for me, uh, I, I would have a different list today versus what I had four years ago. I can tell okay. you that. Because yep. when I went in, you guys can hear me okay, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, when I went in, I went in with um, telling my story and it didn't take, it, it didn't take much to figure out, okay, you know what, she's, you know, shh. It doesn't take much to figure out whether it's it's truth or not. I, I can't get into that right now. But what happened during the process is that I would have appreciated better communication. And most importantly, transparency. Right. I felt that everything was being held near and dear to, the, to their hearts. And I don't want to sit here and, 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 and come across as though I'm complaining about it. I try and look at things from all sides and I have to believe they, because they know not only the law, they know also the current state of how it operates. Even though we might not like it, they're still kind of protecting us, right? But there comes a point in time where what you're wondering and you're not having, you know, I think David's gonna probably talk to this as uh, more of a schedule of a, a communication. But again, it depends on your lawyer because they, they all operate by their own set of rules, too. And they got to be receptive to all this, right? Yeah. You but hold that them. thought, hold that thought, Andy, uh, Angie, because I want to get to the questions. Yeah. And that, like, you're, we're getting into, like, I know. I have to stop myself because I can <laughs> so get ahead of myself. I know. All right. So questions. We, we, the four of us brainstormed a bunch of questions together that we asked, that David has been asked, or what David would recommend. And so... We talked about maybe asking questions that are more open-ended, like we already said, to the lawyer as well. For example, yep. what is your experience with domestic violence? Rather than just how, you know, are you experienced with narcissistic personality disorder? But tell me, what is your experience? The other thing, and I'll give you guys the mic after this, is how are we going to develop a strategy? And you said you went in and talked about your case, but instead of just saying, how would you handle my case? It has to be a bit more collaborative. Like, how are we gonna work together? Because it is a big, a big relationship. Yes, so that was not an option. And I, I respected that at the time because I myself was in a sink or swim situation with what I, what I knew about my marriage and my partner and my case. And, but as time went on, there comes a point in time where it does have to become collaborative. There comes a point in time where they're not the only ones figuring it out. I'm, I was also figuring things out. And I, yeah, was I, like the, to them. I like the question that you said, um, that you also said, and this is something people can ask is how would you handle a case like mine? Yeah. That's and, a great um, question. And I didn't, it is. I didn't know that. I didn't know that question then that I know now. And that's why these communities are so important to help people who are going to be in this position in the future is because I didn't know the questions to ask. I didn't have many questions. I didn't think I had the right to ask questions. I didn't think that I had the right to even ask about a strategy. Well, you know what? Yeah, you do. You do. And I, I, I think there's also coming in, and it, this plays on both sides of the coin, there's the, the client's expectation that I'm seeing the right professional, they're going to protect yeah. me, they're going to take care of me yes. here. And then there's that instinct, and I, I had that instinct, I have to protect this person. Again, that, that white knight syndrome, the, the Laura Dern character in, uh, yeah. it's called Marriage Story, right? Yeah. Yes. Laura Dern character that I need to save this person. We, if we take a step back from that and it becomes more of a conversation and I would use that word, what we're talking about needs to be, and it's a conversation that's not just fixed today when you and I, uh, when I'm getting the background of your story, this has to be an ongoing conversation. So I, I you're right. Angie's question was perfect. It's a perfect open, how would you handle, it's a little more specific, but it's an open-ended question. How would you handle a case like mine? 
And you know what? I think a good lawyer's response is, I need to think about that. Mm. And then we'll let, you know what? Let's continue this conversation. Because if they're prepared to just give a snap answer, be a little wary. Um, that may give you comfort in that moment because you're hearing what you want to hear. But be a little more discerning. I mean, this is what I want people walking away from this uh, is, you know, Angie's now in the position where if I could do it again, I would ask these questions. And I think this is an important conference. And, you know, potentially for any lawyers out there that may be listening, you have to be more receptive. Uh, my hope is that most lawyers are. My experience is that most lawyers think they are. Yeah. But they're, they're not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, I think import, other important questions, I mean, experience with domestic violence, and that can include education, because one of the things when I, I took uh, an intensive uh, four-day domestic violence course of my own volition, not something that was mandatory, although there's discussion that it could be mandatory, mm -hmm. but it's not at this point. Mm -hmm. Lawyers and judges are not required, at least in where I live in Ontario, Canada, um, are not required to take this mandatory education. It doesn't mean that they haven't. It doesn't mean that in their experience throughout their lives that they, they haven't taken that voluntarily, but there's no mandatory education. So ask about that. I, you know, what goes hand in hand with that too is what resources are you connected to in the community? You know, I, I think a lot of the people that are listening in, a lot of the people that, uh, um, uh, that follow you guys on Instagram have suffered some level of family violence, intimate partner violence, domestic violence, course of control. So asking those questions, one of the things that after I took the education, that, that intensive four day education, what I walked away realizing, thinking was, holy crap, mm -hmm. there's so much I don't know. There's so much that I probably missed throughout the course of my career. And I remember I had to go to the courthouse because I was representing kids in court and I, just picked one of the ante rooms where all the lawyers were congregated and was talking about my experience with this course and asked them, you know, they all immediately jumped to it and said, I've taken training. I, I, I know domestic violence. Yeah. Okay. So tell me about your training. Well, legal aid in Ontario made us take two hours. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and it, that's where that ego comes in. That, you know, I took that training and even prior to taking that training, I started immersing myself in research like what Margaret Drew was doing because she she was doing a lot of research on my, I had gotten away. I, I went from being the Laura Dern lawyer to being the Alan Alda lawyer where I was more, you know, con conciliatory, collaborative, mediative, realizing that, you know, the work that I had done in the system oftentimes those high conflict cases came back. So, you know, asking about the resources that they have connections to, asking about um, have they worked with other professionals in the course of a, you know, Angie, if you had somebody around you that was giving you advice, are they prepared to work with that person? Right. Right? Yeah. Or, or if you get an answer that says, well, they what they have to say, they're just helping you. Yeah on the side, yeah. Um, it has nothing to do with the legal case, right. and be wary of that kind of response. It, it's pushback, right? It's pushback yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Um, um, and just, I'm looking at the list. Uh, I, I, have you know, the, I have on the list, how have you supported clients who come to you in a broken state, which relates to, David, what you're saying. You know, those of us who have come out of these crazy relationships need more than just an attorney. You know, a lot of us need mental health experts. We need yep. access to domestic violence um, services. You know, we just, one of our clients yesterday was telling us that she had this awesome set of attorneys in California because on staff, they have someone who deals specifically with financials. And we know that financial abuse is present yep. in 99% of the cases. Yep. These people always hide money. So that's, so this law firm had devoted an entire person or more to you know dealing with financials so this this client felt so supported 
by her firm right. because she's right. like, I didn't even have to, you know, they already knew. They said, we're going to put someone with you to work just on that. And then we're going to deal with the other stuff. So I thought that's amazing. And David, it made me think of you, how you said, I, I know what I don't know, but who do I know who I can call to find out? And that's, that's right. also the basis of Chris and, uh, you know, been there, got out, like our business is not just knowing the answers to everything, but having resources like you guys too, where we're like, I'm not sure, but here's an expert that we can connect to directly Absolutely. or in this public forum to get the information that you need. Yeah. Right. A, lot of the people, interesting. a lot of the people who come to us don't even know to use the term domestic violence. They've been, you know, it's not always physical, right? So they're, yep. they've been emotionally, psychologically, financially abused. I mean, some they, they come to us and they're so broken that they apologize yeah. for talking about how awful their story is. So one of the questions I really love is, tell me about a couple of the most difficult cases you've had to deal with, right? Not even saying narcissism, not even saying domestic Absolutely. violence, but Absolutely. saying, because you know, those ones that were really, really difficult, there was something going on there that those people couldn't work it out. Yeah, that's a great question. That is a great question. And to your point, like, Chris, Give me an example of your results type of thing. <laughs> right. It, well, and, and results are one thing. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I, I think you're asking the question of how did you approach it, which yes. I think yeah. is it, that gives a person an even better perspective of how, and again, um, they may have an answer right then and there, or they may say, you know what, let me think about this because this isn't, you know, you want that person who's listening to you to acknowledge the importance of what you're saying. And you're right, Chris, a lot of people have no idea. The, the, I, I still think the common conception of what constitutes domestic violence is I was, I, I would often hear, well, no, I was never hit. When I would start down screening for domestic violence, I was never hit. Okay. I was, and, and it would be awesome. I was locked in the basement and the windows were boarded over and they, he took away my light bulbs, but it wasn't hit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, and, and, and they may not realize I, I talked to a woman a few weeks ago and just asked a few questions, you know, I, uh, you know, she, she had a lot that she wanted to say. And then I asked a few questions, realized that, okay, she's isolated from family. She's hours, five and a half hours away from family can't really connect. And oftentimes people have been gaslit to believe that the problem is not the other person. The problem is them. Yeah. And, Absolutely. and, you know, that's the importance of what, what you guys are doing and what we're doing here together is that raising of awareness so that people can be empowered to, uh, to, to ask those questions. I mean, I can, I can see this conversation between the four of us continuing on <laughs> into another segment we another day. We talked about that, but it might be a few more uh, series. It's going to be a series. How about the, I, you know, what I wish I knew then that I know now series. Yeah. So we are going to keep going. Um, yeah, I was going to say the other question that we just talked about is just how do you, how do you bill? That's a big thing because, again, a lot of yep. people use their attorney as a therapist and they don't realize that a lot of the, like, $75 an email Right. A lot of times, depending where you're located. So it can get very expensive. I, and I would put that in the, I put that in a retainer letter, you know, so when we confirm things, I say, you know, and, and I think just rethinking as I go back in, setting up a communication pattern. When people are in the moment, they want to send an email. I, and I can remember times at like 11 o'clock midnight, getting emails from clients and what I tell people is every time I open an email and read it, I'm charging you 0.1 of an hour. I just have to. Even if it takes me 30 seconds, I'm charging you 0.1 of an hour. And, you know, that, that adds up. What I would suggest is that you compile these things. And unless it's a, a huge emergency, which I would expect you to contact me about. But, you know, if these are minor things, somebody's late bringing the kids back. That was always uh, a big one that I would hear. Uh, they're 15 minutes late bringing the kids back. You know, save those. And then what we can do is we can carve out 15 minutes. You can send me an email. We'll carve out 15 minutes. And then that way we're answering all of the questions at one time. You know, accessibility of lawyers or maybe not uh, knowing that their staff, uh, other associate lawyers, 
is important because having some kind of communication plan, I think is one of the other questions that you want to ask. So what, you know, how are we going to, especially in those early stages, um, yeah, those are you know, I'd like to discuss things more and, and so but anyway. From my perspective is that it need, that also needs to be, cons there has to be consistency with that. Mm -hmm. Right. It's not like the one time and then we're not going to talk to you for four months and you're wondering what's going on. And, you know, I'm trying to dissect everything because that's how I am by nature anyways. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you get an email with a, a whole litany of documents in it that you don't even know what those documents are. And they say review these and correct it if you need to. And again, I want to look at the, 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 the brighter side of it and not think, oh, my God, that was just so horrible. OK, so they are the better judgment judges of let's not waste money and time, but at least communicate that maybe and say, you know what, we'll, we'll talk about this, get your thoughts together. And so be more consistent with that format of communication. And, you know, don't ignore emails for like weeks and weeks and weeks on end. And just assume that I'm just going to think, okay, well, it's not important or um, they're not going to address it. You know, so that's, that's Come closer, killer. Angie, closer to your mic again. That's a silent killer as well. So yeah, it all comes down to one thing and that's communication, really. We can like yeah. spin this around and we just all circle back to the same thing, communication. Yeah. And to David's so, point, so they're not the, you know, they're not always the best <laughs> at it. <laughs> Communication and setting expectations and along setting the way, too. I mean, I think a, an important role that a lawyer serves is that reality check. Yeah. Their knowledge of the law, um, along with what, what the person is presenting and figuring out what the question is and then being able to answer that question and having those difficult conversations along the way. If somebody has unrealistic expectations about something, it's better to, and, and one of the things that I often saw was not having those conversations along the way, not having those check-ins, the reality checks, and then all of a sudden you're on the doorstep of trial and, or, or getting close to it, and it's a shotgun approach and everything gets resolved. I mean, the reality is the statistics still are 95 to 99% of cases resolved before they ever get to trial. A very small fraction of cases go through to trial. And I think most people, when they step into the shoes and they're meeting a lawyer for the first time, have the opposite perspective, that every case right. goes to trial and that very few get resolved. So having that reassurance um, uh, from a lawyer uh, or an attorney is extremely important. Making feel valued. It, it, you know what? I would check in with my clients at the beginning. I, you know, I would, first thing I would say is put your watch away. You know, we're, we're having this consultation. I'm here to listen to you. And then I would check in at the end. How do you feel? Right. Uh, you know, a person may say, well, I feel overwhelmed. Okay. So let's talk a little more. Let's unpack that a little bit. What can I do to help you feel less overwhelmed? More often what I heard was I feel relieved because mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was getting into. And I feel a sense of relief. And, and, you know, I would, again, reality check. Well, <laughs> the relief you're feeling right now, it, there will be peaks and valleys of, of what you're going to go through. So it, it, this is where I would say, especially if I recognize some things, do you mind if I give you the number of a friend of mine? They may be able to talk to you about these things. And again, to your point, Lisa, you don't, Again, it's not, I'm not a therapist. It's not a skill within my skill set. Why would I want you paying my hourly rates when I know I have a friend who charges much less than I do in an hourly rate to, and has the skills, has those tools in their, uh, their tool belt to be able to help you, right? When people hear those things, it's, it becomes an easy decision. Right. People will say, yeah, absolutely. But you're also building um, that trust. That makes a lot of sense. But you're yes. also building trust, right? Yep. Angie, and that exactly. So you took, Angie, you took the word right out of my mouth. Yeah. And that yeah. is so and, and, and so important. Uh, being at a frontal you point in your it, life where, you know, you're on edge because you don't know what's going to come at you. And then to hear that, you're like, I can, I can at least trust this person. Yeah. 
Yeah, when, I mean, you start, and that was, when you start losing trust in your lawyer, then it's all, it's just a whole other playing field. Well, and, and you're right, Angie. And, and it sounds like you went through an unfortunate situation where. Can I be honest somebody, with you? I refuse to look at. You can at, always be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I refuse to look at it as an unfortunate situation. And I'm looking at it like everything else I do in life it served a purpose for that moment in time, right? That uh, first attorney served, and I'm not gonna sit here, like his expertise served a purpose in that moment in time. And I'm gonna leave it there. And it doesn't mean that that same person's gonna take it home because there's the other areas of, of divorce, right? And then perhaps you just need a different level of expertise or someone else to just, you know, do that part of it. So I refuse to look at it as a negative. I, just, I have to look at the, although it's a sliver, I have to look at the silver lining of it all. Yeah. And that's, you, the, 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 it's incredible that you walk away from that with that perspective. Um, I think I tend to be a little more critical uh, of my colleagues, recognizing that people are spending so much money yes. uh, on lawyers and that's money that you don't recover. Right. No. It's, so again, that's another thing that's so important. The billing is one thing, but recognizing that, especially if you get into a court situation, um, you will be spending a lot of money. And I know that, I think in uh, Lisa, in your post uh, about this event, somebody asked about, this is presuming that people can afford lawyers, yeah. yes, that which is a whole different conversation about access to justice and how can we yeah. take what quite frankly I think is a broken system and how can we make that system better by having all of the professionals that people may need on site uh, to be able to triage. It's something that, that I've been passionate about for quite a long time about how we can improve our systems. Um, it would take a lot of work, but I think we have a core foundation there and there's an opportunity there, but yeah, and just that's because be I, another in our series. That yeah, I just, just, wrote that I, just because I look at it that way doesn't mean I agree with it. And that's why we're all here is how do we get that one resource center with the reliable, your, your center of your, your center of care, right? Like Lisa, you said that mm -hmm. that one law firm in LA has their own finance. They're not outsourcing it, right? They have it in house. And their How client cool. is, Thrilled. How brilliant. Is that? She just had, and she just got a really good outcome um, with amazing. another part of her case. But she, but the thing is, she feels taken care of. How rare is Absolutely. that? Absolutely. That you yeah. feel it's... so taken care of by, by an attorney yeah. after getting out of this chaotic yeah. marriage. I can't imagine that they want to provide the warm and fuzzy. Fuzzies. There's got to be a certain <laughs> level of empathy and understanding right? Especially when they've gotten to know you as a client and that they can trust you. You have to reciprocate that in order that you have to, they have to show you that you can trust them. And, you know, um, it's, it's also, it's a holistic approach. Too, yeah, it is. Right? It, it is. is. The, the legal part is simply one part of who that person is. There's the emotion, there's the finance, there's yeah. all of that. I, and it's why I ended up landing in collaborative law is because I do my part in the legal. We assemble a team around the separating couple okay. and we, we talk about it holistically. So you have the family uh, professional that can be involved. And if we need other professionals along that vein, you know, whether it's domestic violence or whether it's, we can, we can build that in. You have the financial professional that you can bring in if necessary. Uh, some people need that, some people don't, but, and we're all screening for domestic violence as we go along and trying to recognize certain patterns because I think you're right, Lisa, financial uh, violence and withholding of finances and other things that come along with uh, that part of family violence, I, it's important to be able to recognize. Yeah, and that, um, I just want to answer that... a question quickly, one second, Chris. So someone's saying, is this gonna be on YouTube because they're at work? <laughs> yes, well, we'll put it on our Instagram feed and then at some point, Chris will get it on um, YouTube. All right, sorry for interrupting that. I apologize for the Blair Witch quality of my, uh, I'm holding my phone and 
I don't have the steadiest hand anymore. I'm no, you're older. fine. You're good. You're big on the and movie you know references. Everything that he's, he's talked about <laughs> uh, from a consumer point is the, is, is the beginning of gold standard right there. Yes. Yes, but, but the gold, the, it's the beginning of gold standard. Right, yes. and, and to what David was talking about with it taking a team, and no, it doesn't all have to be in-house. Our one client found an attorney that has the financial person, but I, I, Lisa, it's almost like every call we do with new prospective clients, we talk about the concept of it taking a team. You, know, you need a great attorney, you need a, a therapist, and we even, you know, I, lo I love when I have a slide, for, I don't know how this will look, it's low tech. Does that look okay? Can you see that? Yes, it takes a team. It's just mirror image backwards, but yes, it's a table and it, it takes a team. Um, someone's quickly right. saying, can you reintroduce everyone? Just quickly, Chris and I are been there, got out. Angie is what uh, a lot of things, but including like a <laughs> test client. And David is a family law attorney. Okay, keep going. <laughs> no, so all I was saying is, you know, you don't want to use your attorney as a therapist because that's super expensive. No. No. You don't want to turn to your friends and family for um, like therapeutic, like where it requires like a trauma informed therapist, that kind of support. Your friends and family love you and they support you, but yeah. they're, they're going to say things like, why didn't you leave earlier? Why was it you right. just do it? Why, you know, so or, you need or even worse. Hold those pillars. Or can't, can't you just stick it out? Oh, I mean, that's, that's the worst. Only, yeah. Right? Okay. So, um, so the, and, and this is my, this is my uh, assistant. <laughs> oh. seems to come in. I have two of them. To, to David, they don't do to, much work. To, to Chris's point, because we talked about this the other day, it's that chatter. Eliminate the chatter. Um, oh, well, I heard about that lawyer. And you know what? That lawyer didn't do well for that person. And, you know, they love you. Uh, these people love you. But also, they're, they're not really equipped. We're barely equipped in this arena. Can you imagine those who didn't live through what you're going through? So, you know, lean on support, lean on them for support, but eliminate a lot of the chatter and align yourself with the experts, do your research. Um, there was uh, situations, you know, during the, during the case where crisis come up. Well, who's going to be the expert on that? And believe it or not, these professional experts are scrambling to find professional experts. So the idea of having a law firm or a resource center like yourselves that your people are able to go to, it's gonna, you're gonna get a leg up in that battle. Yeah. We can't all do our I, jobs. I, when we, when we're I, I, I completely agree, Angie, but I think it, it's a matter of where does the funding come from? You know, I, there, there are initiatives all across North America that we, we, we say things, we pay lip service to things like access to justice. Right. Uh, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, you know, what I've seen seems to fail. I, I mean, in Canada, in 2013, there was a, there was a paper called um, Beyond Wise Words, and it's, it was Meaningful Change. And it was written by a former uh, Supreme Court justice, or no, he was on the Supreme Court at the time. And it, from, when I read it, it was validating in that it was a complete condemnation of how we had been doing things. Mm -hmm. And it talked about having appropriate services and triaging and the right professionals to deal with the myriad of problems that, that we often see in family court. And here we are eight years later, right. and it, it becomes a footnote in lectures that I do, it, it becomes a, you know, what a great idea, but it, we still, I mean, we had family legislation that didn't change for decades. Yeah. You know, we, we just, you know, for the viewers in Canada and in Ontario, we just had a more fulsome definition of family violence uh, incorporated into our provincial and federal legislation. Before that, the only reference that we really had was uh, past conduct is not to be taken into account unless it impacts somebody's ability to parent kids. Well, okay. So of course, domestic violence could be characterized that way, but how many times you hear judges? Well, what he did was to her and not to the kids. So therefore not recognizing the emotional, psychological, 
mental, physical, and other impacts that it has on the other person's ability to parent. All the time, David. Right? All the time. Yeah. All right. I want to get so into Andy. You Okay, yeah, I Angie gonna... can lead the way to, to get a center put together. We'll put together a North American center. I, I love the it, idea. I think I think it's, it could be the start of something. Yeah, well, I have it written down for another part of this series <laughs> that we're going to come back for, but I want to get back to you, um, how we can expect to be treated by our attorney. Like what in the relationship, we touched on a few things like, yeah. you know, excellent communication. That's a key component. You know, what are the expectations going to be from the start? How often is time going to be set aside to talk about the case? Many people that we talk to, Chris and I all the time, like the majority say, my lawyer hasn't called me back. My lawyer doesn't call me back. And, and we explain to them that this is like a double whammy because not only do you feel like left out of knowing what's going on and terrified, but this is almost for many people a, um, a repetition of the abuse that's gone on in the marriage or the relationship where they've gotten the silent treatment. So when your own lawyer, who is your ally, is not returning your calls in your head, you're thinking you're being punished. And I think a lot of lawyers don't understand that. You know, people in these situations require a lot more emotional support, but this has to be, so this is where Chris and I come in, we're like, you can't yeah. rely on your attorney for that emotional right. support. You can rely on people like us that's who, right. who so who can save you money and provide that emotional support as well as the reality checks and pointing you to other resources where you can get that support and understand you're not being punished by your attorney, but your attorney has other things to deal with. However, if your attorney is very clear from the beginning, that shows a healthy relationship in general by saying, here's the boundaries. Let's, let's come up with a plan. Like as your attorney, I'll talk to you every two weeks or whatever it is, you know, but, but again, where everything is very clear. So you know what you can expect and your attorney can know what you expect. So you're not getting, so, so he or she is not getting those emails in the middle of the night that they have to open and be like, oh geez, here they are again with more stuff to deal with. Well, you know, the first six to 12 months, I started to realize um, because it was a pattern of lack, oh, there was just lack of communication and I don't, I'm not gonna say anything about it. It is what it is, it's how they, they operate or whatever. But I kept saying to myself, um, they don't hold your hand and it's a sink or swim situation and you got to catch on because if you don't, you're done. And I kept saying to my, to, and, and I only had a select few people that I spoke to my situation about. There, like you said, you, you don't talk to too many people about this. And I kept saying, but we need a liaison. We need a liaison because what if that person doesn't have the strength not only to survive what they went with in their marriage, but also, not, not, I don't think it, it's intentional by the lawyer. It's, they're the logical one in this situation, right? They're, they're so, I think that they mean well by staying grounded and trying to keep you grounded because we're so emotional, but they're not doing it. <laughs> they're not doing any service. So how can we get better at that? And, and here we are four years la later, I stumble upon Lisa and Chris, liaison. I know that there's some coaches locally as well doing similar work. So I kept seeing this from four years ago and here we are. So it, it's progress, it's progress. I know, cause I lived it from four years ago. I identified it four years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, coaching is, to me, is, I remember having a conversation with a friend of mine who's now a judge uh, years ago, and it was, a, conceptually, it was, because everything goes to uh, uh, reality television, but could you imagine a divorce, and I, I said divorce coach, before the term was, wow. just somebody who helps that person yes. through. I, I, I mean, it, it's such an important role to if you have somebody who can help gather the thoughts to tease out the questions that need to be asked to get to the underlying interests and then the lawyer is working with not just the client but the the coaches as well to be able to have that so that i mean i, I would never profess to say that i got everything right and i would tell clients that i would show my vulnerability that i may say the wrong thing Call me on it. Yeah. Don't be afraid to call. I just because I have some letters behind my name, that doesn't matter. You know what? It, it's important that you feel that the questions that you have are answered. Sometimes, though, where the clients need help, 
people need help to formulate the questions. They're not quite sure what those questions are. So what you guys are doing is, is so invaluable to creating that holistic wraparound yep. type of team to be able to help people get through. I mean, I, I said for a long time, when people are going through separation and divorce, even without any kind of family violence involved, they're not at their best. They're, 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 you know, there's a mental illness attached to separation and divorce, which is situational in a lot of cases. And, and yet we're, as lawyers, because it's about getting to the finish line, we're putting them in situations, putting people in situations where you're pressing them to make those difficult decisions immediately. You know, and, and oftentimes, think about resolutions that are made. I'm sure one or all three of you could tell me about that moment when the lawyer said, okay, you know what? I don't think we should argue this. Let's come up with a settlement. And you're feeling like you're under the gun. Why does it have to be that way? Why does it have to be the specter of, we're about to go in front of a judge. Let's resolve everything right now. As, as opposed to being planned and coordinated so that it's not a rushed decision. Those are the decisions. Those are the, the uh, decisions that people make that are often built on a foundation of sand, right? It's, I, 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 one of the other things I say, aside from I don't know what I don't know, is it's not where you end up, but how you get there. How you get there is so important. Oftentimes when people came to see me, I had a good sense in meeting with them for an hour or two hours where, they, where I thought they should end up. Oftentimes they ended up close, but sometimes they didn't. Sometimes there, there was a right turn because questions were being asked and, and people were able to be open about what was really within their interest. But if you don't, if that person doesn't feel like they were a part of it, as soon as they say, my lawyer made me do it, yeah. or the mediator made me do it, I, I would do independent legal advice on mediated agreements. And I'd say, okay, I'm noticing this. Um, can you tell me about that? Not, I'm criticizing this decision. I, I'm just saying, I'm, I noticed you agreed to this. Can you tell me about this? And if they said, well, the mediator told me I had to, then I would say, okay, then you need to go back to the mediator and here are some of the questions. That, again, it's about that open conversation. Um, people fe feeling comfortable to be able to say exactly what's on their mind, what they're going through. Yeah, we said you should never feel afraid. Never feel afraid of your lawyer. But a no, lot of no. people are afraid because it's like, oh, they're the authority, so I don't even know if I should ask the question. Exactly. Like we keep saying you should ask any questions you have, you should have it. And then we talked about as well, you should have a sense of transparency. It shouldn't be this, um, you know, like I, well, I don't want to get into the red flags for an attorney yet. We'll get into that in a couple more minutes. But like, you know, you should, it should be a back and forth. And like David said so many times, you should have a sense of uh, validation, you know, like yeah. tell me the story. I believe all of that. Yeah. And coaches, coaches can help with that because it's about, okay, so, you know, you have these different individuals around you and these are your questions. Which question goes to which professional too, right? Exactly. Like, you know, is that a Dave question or is that an Angie question? Because Angie, Angie's working on a different part of the, the case, okay. whether, whether it's therapeutic or, or whatever's going on yeah. that's actually a little perk that chris and i offer to our coaching clients we call it like the check-in where we say we're going to save you money with your attorney and you don't have to schedule a whole call with us but when you get that email and you're like oh my god what do i do we're the buffer yeah. send it to us we'll take 10 minutes we'll either get on a call with you and not charge you for it or we'll review the email and get back to you and say like this is not something you need to go to your attorney about so there's 75 bucks or whatever saved you know, or this is something to document. This is something to save later. Or like, oh, he's th physically threatening your life through your kid's phone call. Uh, yeah, tell the attorney and possibly go to the DA. You know, where it's like people who know more about it. But again, it's it's connecting you to the right resource, yep. you know, to save money. And again, I, I love that you said like, you know, knowing who to call Absolutely. rather than thinking, I just always have to call my attorney because that's where we really run up the bills. And the attorney doesn't always know the answer. Resources are key. 
Right. And I found right. that not all, it's not even that they didn't know. It's almost like some of the resources don't, don't exist. And if they do, there's only two or three that are that specialized. Mm -hmm. So that's an issue right there. And guess what? Those two or three specialized experts, they got a year long list. <laughs> but you need yeah. a resolution today or in the next month. Right? I know. I know. So, but, you know, I hope, I, I, I can't wait to see what this is going to look like in, 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 you know, even six to 12 months because, you know, like David said, he's, you know, that's really great that I can look at it. What happened from my, from my first portion, the first portion of my case, I have no choice but to look at it because I'm at a point now, I can't wait to move on and, and start living the best life. And I can't look at the past as it was all, I have no choice. It's only going to harm me. But what I would like to see is that this doesn't happen. And that's why we're all here. Right, right. right. So now let's get Absolutely. into what are the red flags. So if you are meeting an attorney for the first time, you're shopping, you're either a divorce attorney or you're post-judgment and you're going back and you need help. We came up with a little list of some of the things that are definite no-nos. Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I can, it was one of the things that I was, what I learned throughout my career is being very careful with the language. Oh, no. Uh -oh. He's oh, spinning he's again. Spinning. All right. While he's spinning, I can, an we can one of us can answer that question. Well, well, I have one that's not actually on our list. And it's, at least you'll remember this. When you yeah. ask an attorney about like difficult, um, you know, uh, the difficult cases or if you handle domestic violence cases, that kind of thing, and they mm -hmm. go, oh, we handle all kinds right. of cases. Right. 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 Red flag. Right. Right. They don't. They didn't right. answer the question at all. They're, did they? they're, yeah. evading, they're evading the question. Absolutely. That is yep. a huge red flag. It's about mm -hmm. teaching people how to read the situation and read right. people. It's a whole other level. It's a whole other skill set when you think about it. Yeah. Something I certainly didn't know four years ago. I know. Okay, David, you can answer that question about the definitive <laughs> language. We saw. Well, I, I, yeah. One of the things I, I would caution people, and I became mindful myself, is when you use that definite language, always and never. Uh, kind of, the, it's all or nothing language is what I call it. But be very wary of that because something may seem like it's, uh, people use the word slam dunk, that it's slam dunk. You go into court, any one of a, I could put the same case in court in front of five different judges and potentially get five different decisions. So be wary of the always and never. The only thing that I've ever come across that is pretty definite in Canadian law is child support. But anything else is, uh, I would say to people, here's what the law can say or, or what the law might say. However, when you get into a court, it's subject to that judge's interpretation. So trying to stay away from that definite language, I think sometimes, again, lawyers try and use that language to give comfort to clients. You know, in a domestic violence situation where, uh, you know, there's children involved, trying to comfort people by saying, yeah, there, there's no way you can lose this. That may very well be the case, but it's, it's a cautionary tale because that one in a hundred where it doesn't pan out the way that way or something else uh, comes up that the judge, it's, I remember being in court one time and it was an appeal and it was just, it was a nonsense appeal. And the one judge just, I, I, I wasn't very fond of this judge, but again, I thought it was a slam dunk and I saw him seize on one little fact, which wasn't even a fact, which wasn't relevant, which he had spoon fed to the other counsel. Uh, and I didn't have a chance to respond in my factum because the other counsel hadn't even brought it up as an argument. And it was like watching the worst car accident happen right in front of your eyes seeing them seize on that. And I remember as a lawyer, my heart just sinking mm. into my feet. Um, so you don't, when you put it in the hands of somebody else, a judge, it's out of your control and it's out of your lawyer's control, despite how good your lawyer may be. 
every lawyer can tell a story about that sure thing that wasn't a sure thing at all. So that definite language, um, I became very careful of that. So it's a red flag to me when they say it will or or always and never, the, that kind of language. Yeah, I think so many of our clients and people in this community can completely relate to walking in a courtroom and feeling like it's going to be fine, there's going to be justice, and then all of a sudden, like, this horrible thing happens, and they just come to us on these calls like, I, I can't, you know, they're just they're speechless. You can never yep. be too sure of this outcome. From where I'm sitting, I have never, ever thought I got this. And that's the worst thing you can do to yourself. So um, be grateful that if you did your research and you landed the resources required to um, take this on, and FAIR is hopefully the, the bare minimum you can hope for and what everybody should hope for. Um, just, just, just coast with it and just see, like never think, oh, I got this. It's going to be all right. You <laughs> it's don't. tricky. It's tricky because you want to go in confident, but you, you don't want to be like, it's only going to go my way. Confidence in your evidence is one thing, but confidence of the outcome is completely, we don't know, like to yeah. David's point. I'm so glad you did friend thing, and you, right? One of the other things like Angie and I have seen more recently, I know Angie, you were sharing it with us, but there are three or four cases out there right now where in the face of uh, domestic violence, the parental alienation argument has come up and has been successfully argued in different jurisdictions in Canada uh, over the last few weeks. Um, you sent the one, Angie, but there are two or three other other cases out there where the judge took the parental alienation in the face of a domestic violence uh, situation. And in one of the cases, um, the, the person actually acknowledged, although minimized the domestic right. violence and the judge just, that's now cast in stone. The judge made that decision and basically said this was a horrible mother and and, and so now you're you're stuck with that to, to undo it in appeal is uh, at times i mean it's herculean people often don't have the fortitude to be able to go through it let alone the finances to be able to go through it right yeah yeah it's awful it's right, a so rampant, rampant trend and we could do a whole other session on parental alienation and uh, yeah. how awful it is but it's it's so widespread that i remember meeting with my attorney and my ex never really even claimed abuse but he said he said to me well if she's you know if she claims that there's abuse that you're an abuser we'll just respond by accusing her of parental alienation it's like a, it's like in the game plan for family law it's a knee jerk yeah yeah Crazy. All right, so let's keep. Let's go back to the red flag. So the definitive language, absolute no, red flag. Um, the experience with all cases, that's another one. Um, and then David, can you talk a little bit about we called it proprietariness to watch out for that? Yeah, you know, again, it's this may sound like we're demonizing lawyers. It's it's not. It's no. this is meant to be helpful yeah. to lawyers too, but that I'm the expert. Um, you listen to me and don't question what I have to say. And, and you know what? I'll say this from experience. I probably did that at some point earlier in my career. If somebody's unsure, one of the things that I did was I would, I would offer to them, if you're unsure about it, I want to make sure that you're unsure. So maybe what we can do is how about you get a second opinion about it? I don't have an issue with right. that. My ego can take that. But lawyers often would get their backs up because they would see it as questioning. And if that person is questioning too, that's a red flag. As soon as you get shut down because I'm the expert, few lawyers, I wouldn't call lawyers necessarily experts in law, but lawyers know what the law right. could say. Um, but your uh, people coming in to see us are definitely experts, like we alluded to before, in their own lives. 
If you're shut down from asking questions or pursuing a line, it's up to me to, to help formulate uh, as a lawyer to help say, okay, let's spin this out. Let's see how this, this might play out. So you're asking me this question. So here's how it could go, right? It, it, especially if it's something that I disagree, um, if somebody wants to pursue some kind of line or wants to put forward an argument, let's say. They wanna put forward a certain argument. Okay, so let's spin this out about how this might be able to go. That's where my expertise and my experience comes in. But to shut a person down and say, you have to listen to me, I'm the expert, or the documents that I draft have to come from me and let me use the language or only answer the other one that comes up that I don't think we talked about is, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, only answer the questions that I ask, don't get into a narrative, I don't want to hear it, right? I know what I need to put together to tick off the boxes again, and if I hear something from you that's contrary to what the theory of the case that I'm going to build in the next 15 minutes or the next hour, which is going to impact the rest of your life and your children's lives, be very wary of that. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the proprietariness. It gets into the the next point that we talked about too. Is that uh, uh, you know the whole I'm the expert. Don't question me. Right. And that goes back to what I said at the beginning about how people have to be careful that they're not entering another cycle of a toxic relationship where they just yeah. blindly you know succumb to someone else's authority. Who honestly you know, is in a position where, you know, your lawyer is your ally, but, and no offense, Dave, but your lawyer is making money off the case. And the longer the case goes on, the more money the lawyer makes. So that's why you really need to feel like your lawyer is on your side and has your best interest. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I don't know how long we've been on. I'm sure it's over an hour. <laughs> I was going to say. We're getting there. We were we on can, for two hours. We're not quite there yet. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, so we, you know, so the whole thing we also talked about with, with people or said is how you can change the system yourself, you know, as a client by almost having higher expectations and demanding more from the professionals that you work with, especially your attorney. And, um, I have some other notes here about, you know, how as a consumer, you really need to push back um, and ch change is not going to happen on its own. Um, let's see. We, we also talked about something I had never heard of that I guess you have in Canada. Maybe it's here too called unbundling. Can somebody talk about that? So in, in a nutshell, unbundling services is the lawyer being a, a part of only a, a part of the case. So I'll give an example a mediated solution that comes up from an independent mediator. I, as a lawyer, am hired to give independent legal advice on what that person has decided. Oftentimes what I've seen is lawyers see their role as ripping apart the agreement, finding any weaknesses. A mediated agreement is always going to have some compromises in it, which if you hit it out of the park in a courtroom, that may not happen. But unbundling services would be me giving independent legal advice, asking questions, giving my opinion on that. And if you, if you want to sign it, then, then I sign it, as opposed to me as a lawyer saying, well, if I don't agree with this resolution, then I'm not going to put my name on it. So it's, it's taking the case. I mean, you've all been through court. It's taking the case in parts. And a lawyer only being, you know, it could be drafting a settlement conference brief. So almost like, what we cut, like so, say, so with a lot of these cases, at least our high conflict clients, um, not our high conflict, you know what I mean. But there are situations where they have custody and financial. So instead of having one attorney handle the whole thing, they could have somebody who specializes or they're more comfortable with that. Is it like that? And then another person do the financial? Well, it, it could be, but I, I, I think the intention is if you have one lawyer representing you on, on one part of the whole case, have them represent, you know, if it's in court. So I, I think a lot of people that are in court would have one lawyer. Okay. But when you get to alternatives to court, uh, or it could be we're, we're seeing an increase in self-represented litigants in, in across North America. It's because we're that out That doesn't of mean that. I know. 
What's that? You have no it's money. Because we're out of money. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, but you could hire a lawyer to give you advice on an agreement that you reached. You could hire a lawyer to help you with just one part of the case, whether it's a particular motion and not even having to go into court. See, the lawyer's conception always was, if I'm in for a penny, I'm in for a pound. So I have to be involved in the whole thing. That's not the case. Unbundling allows the lawyer, lawyers are also worried about liability. Unbundling services allows a lawyer to give a, a specific service. So it could be representation on one motion and drafting the material on one motion. And then, so be, it would be one of the other questions that people could ask is, I can't afford to retain you for the whole case. Are you able to do, to handle the separate parts of the case for me? So as opposed to a separate lawyer handling custody and handling finances, it would be a separate lawyer handling a motion, a pr procedural step in the case that's going on. How do you and think I don't know if this would fall, I, I don't, I don't know if this would fall under that same umbrella, but what we um, recommend sometimes that people consider is hiring an attorney, not that they're going to be pro se, but they hire an attorney to be sort of um, a consultant that they can ask about, you know, the, the legal part of it, but then they go into the court, they're, they're representing themselves. Yep, absolutely. That would be absolutely fit within unbundling services. You can, the lawyer as an advisor, um, rather than being on record uh, and giving, you know, there were, I, I remember people who couldn't afford to retain me for say a separation agreement, but they could retain me to talk to them and have that initial consultation. I can give some of the higher level points of what the law, again, what the law could say. And then, you know, separation agreements by and large, and I'm sure it's the same in the United States, the language is, I'd say 95%, 90 to 95% of the language in a separation agreement is pretty static. And then it's that five to 10% that gets particularized to that case. I, I have, and I probably would be frowned on by other lawyers, but put together a document for them, a template separation agreement. So they're not having to pull something from the internet because the internet still doesn't have uh, credible resources for, and I haven't checked in a year and a half, so I probably should bite my tongue. But last I checked, there weren't credible resources. When people came into me with an internet agreement and they wanted to formalize it, I was often redoing the whole thing. Um, but I would give these people, you know, let's say it was custody. Okay, here are all the clauses that come up in custody, and then I'd leave an open section for them. I mean, anything else that you guys might think of that is particular to the two of you and, and your child, your children. Um, so, so yeah, that, that would be, Chris, is hiring somebody uh, to do that and just be the advisor along the way. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I'm going to look that up more because our conversation was the first time I ever heard of something like that. But I had done that for part of my divorce and my in the beginning, before I went to mediation, my attorney said, don't even tell your ex that you have an attorney representing you. Pay me a much smaller fee as a consultant rather than a full retainer. Um, let's come up with some plans. Let's see if we can get the parenting stuff done in mediation. You're not going to get everything done in mediation, but you can save this much money. So he was behind the scenes advising me. I went in on my own, all innocent. Like I didn't know anything, but I had everything like before me and I knew what to ask for. And, you know, my six different plans and only accept the top three. And it was really, really successful and really helpful. And it was way cheaper than by the time yep. shortly thereafter when he had to step in and say, yeah, she has an attorney and now we're going to fight for the next um, 10 months. So, yeah. All right, well, so it, it goes along, it would be another red flag is if, if you were to approach a lawyer and say, I only want you to be a part of this part of the case, but the lawyer says, no, it's all or nothing, mm. um, then be, be wary of that. Because unbundled, unbundled services, uh, certainly in Canada, have taken off in the last half dozen years. And what I do is I just, I do a specific retainer, again, setting the expectations. This is what you've asked me to do. And here are the three bullet points within the retainer. 
people sign the retainer. And so if we go outside of that, then I would tell people, then we have to sign a separate retainer if you're asking me to do more than just this. Yeah. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Okay, so I, I think we've covered most of what I had wanted to cover myself today. I we had extensive notes. I, but one thing um, I just wanted to touch on too was the part we said about how important it is to have empathy. You know? Yeah. Do, do any of you want to get into that a bit? I the mean, skills, collaboration. Yeah. I mean, it's how they look at, I think it's how the lawyers look at it. Is it really their job? They're there to be logical. They're there to, you know, they know the law like they point. They know it. How do you put it? I loved how you said it, David. They know the oh. law, but. Um, you, David, but, if you don't but, remember, I have here, you had said oh. that, that people are born, like they have an ability to play well with others, to be yes. collaborative, but it's not, you know. It's I not think something that's easy to learn. I love, I love what I'm hearing about how, like I, I said to him that he's representing the gold standard. He's getting his ducks in a row. That's so when a client comes into his office, knowing about several situations, about several situations, and the ones that are primarily on the rise, um, he's getting his resource. He's, 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 he's got a network to provide to his client. And I think that is, that's gonna start going a long way, I think. I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. I don't need to call him or, you know, to be my, you know, it's, he's gonna have someone lined up for someone to deal with that, right? Yeah. Well, and, and I don't handle litigation matters. I think that's the other thing too. I don't handle litigation matters anymore, and that would be a whole separate episode of why I don't. <laughs> but what I do is I have, I know there are probably about three or four lawyers in the community that I have tremendous respect for, for how they conduct litigation files. And so if somebody, if somebody needs that option, when they come to me, I'm able to say, I can say with confidence that one of these three lawyers will be able to help you. That's amazing. Right? And I know what their approach is. And that's the thing. People don't know that. Yeah. Oftentimes, they're going online, they're typing in divorce lawyer, and the first name that pops up, because they've spent the money on Google to, to do it, that doesn't necessarily yeah. mean the word of mouth. I did, I did very little advertising, but I was never, I never had a shortage of clients, not to use absolute language, but... I, I didn't suffer from a shortage of clients because word of mouth. People, if people feel that they were treated with respect, that meant a lot more to me than lawyers referring me work. It was yeah. uh, former clients referring me work. Yeah, I had made a note. I had made a note just to what he just said last night. It's about it's about word of mouth. It's it's old school, no fancy sales and marketing. Um, it is, uh, you know, maybe the, the word, the right word isn't results, but kind of, it's like, how did you handle it from start to finish? Right. Was it a good ending? Was it not? Was, how did you make, how did you leave me? Well, right. also, how did you feel along the way? Oh, absolutely. Most definitely. You that know? was always more important yeah. to me. Yeah. Right. I mean, my divorce attorney from years ago, he made me feel like he really cared the whole time. And I so needed that. And I feel like his role in my life helped me heal and move forward. And probably the significant part of why Chris and I were able to do this today, because I felt so supported, you know, and he and I are still in touch occasionally. He's like, don't send me any of your clients. <laughs> Cause he is, he is like an emotional person. He, he feels things deeply, but you know, having someone like that as your attorney, who you know, you feel like cares about you and is not trying to take advantage makes such a big difference. So, um, so not for I'm, today, not for today, but my experience was the opposite. <laughs> Put that down as another one in the series. Yeah, and how does that, isn't that incredible? To, like, I'm shocked to hear your, your experience. I'm like, wow, that exists. And then there's people like Chris and I, right? But yeah. I, think, I think your experience is more unique I think the masses is what we've been talking about today. Yeah. Well, hopefully. <laughs> One last rep, rep, 
red flag before we go is be beware. So we talked about uh, marriage story. We talked about the Laura Dern character. We talked about the Alan Alda character. Be very wary of the Ray Liotta character. <laughs> The Ray Liotta character is win at all costs. Yeah. And you know what? I don't even need to hear from you. I will, uh, I'll take this forward. I mean, and I, it's, I say it somewhat tongue in cheek, but I remember I was presenting at a conference one time and there was the uh, a family lawyer, well-known family lawyer from that area. I won't say where, but that person got on stage and it was talking about negotiating resolutions. And I was in there presenting the collaborative law part. That person was in there presenting litigation. And that person said, once I sit down with the person for an hour and I know, th and I asked, very specifically said, I asked them these questions. And once I know what the story is, then we take off and go to court. And it was, it's that pit bull lawyer People think they want a pit bull lawyer. I, I, people would call me. I need a pit bull. My job was to, in that moment, talk to them about, okay, here are the different personality types. Now that you have information, now that you're informed, would you change your mind on what you think you need? Because the Ray Liotta character would is the one that would end up with 150,000, would end up with a, a lien against your home uh, without hesitation, put a lien against your home and you'd end up resolving it on the doorstep of trial or even worse, you go through a 20 day trial and, and end up with the same result that you maybe could have had at a much earlier stage. So, yeah, right. David, I'm so, so glad, glad you brought that up again because every time I, I'm not giving away any spoilers, but it, it's just like a gut wrenchingly awful, like you just two hours, just miserable. And I remember after Lisa and I saw it, I said to her, man, I wish mine had gone that well. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So anybody who hasn't seen the film Marriage Story, which came out, what, a couple of years ago, you should see it because yeah. it's, it's very interesting. All right. Um, so I'm going to start winding it up. But we are absolutely going to do this again. Um, I hope that everybody has, you know, hope, learned how important it is to have some oversight of your case. And that this has been really helpful in terms of, you know, red flags, how to expect to be treated by your attorney, what to ask, et cetera. And you know how to get in touch with us directly if you have any further questions, because certainly I'm sure Angie and David would be willing to, well, you know, they're going to be back on <laughs> and talk about that and, and other stuff. So thanks everybody again for listening. And Angie and David, thank you so much, Angie, for coming up with this idea in the first place. Thank you. Thank you for creating the safe space. Thank you for creating this community. And, um, you know, it's important when we talked about uh, aligning ourselves and, 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 and you know, leading off people for emotional support. You need, you need, you need to try, right? And this is kind of it. So, thank yeah, you for that. I'm so glad. And thanks for putting us in touch with David, who is going to be leading the tribe in the gold yes. standard of what to expect with Absolutely. attorneys with these very difficult cases. Yeah. You know, we're really thrilled. Um, we're going to recommend you to everyone that we know of in, in your area who can take you because because you are really like just an excellent example of the type of attorney that everybody should um, be able to have. Well, just give me a little bit of lead time. I, I right, I, I'm, I haven't reinstated my. I'm still non-practicing. I'm taking a bit of time off because 20 years of practicing law and then uh, leading a charity through a pandemic, not knowing where the money was coming from, took its toll on me. So I'm probably going to be non-practicing until the end of the year. And we'll, we'll make a waiting list. Practice. We'll have a but waiting David, list for you. But David, <laughs> it, did I understand yes. correctly? Because I did meet. When, with one lawyer, they don't litigate in court. They that is that the path you go to court? Is that, I miss I, I I'm an accredit. I will soon be an accredited mediator, and and most of the work that I did was collaborative. Okay. So col collaborative means both people have lawyers, and then we bring in family professionals, or sometimes they go to a family professional first, and then we work together as a team and a financial professional. 
uh, can be a part of that. And we can bring in, uh, there are other people. So again, it's that kind of wraparound holistic approach. Um, there was a time where we would kind of eschew the, the domestic violence cases, thinking that the system wasn't uh, equipped to do it. But we're, we do have mandatory training for domestic violence so that we can recognize. And actually, my, you know, my view is not every high conflict case or case involving intimate partner violence is, uh, is right for collaborative, but we can actually, I feel we can provide safer environments. If you know, going in what the concerns are, you can actually provide safer environments for people as opposed to, I'm honestly surprised that there aren't more fatalities coming out of divorce court. Yep. This, th what you just talked about is another one I just wrote down for the series on collaborative law, because I think, um, yeah, I think we're, <laughs> we've covered so much already. <laughs> so, yeah, we have. But, we have. but I want to thank you guys so much again, both of you and Chris, of course, for, um, for doing this with us. And we're going to post it live as soon as it all uploads. Thanks, guys. Well, I'm very honored to have been asked. So thank you. Thank you, Angie. Thank you, I thank you Lisa and Chris. I was, I was You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk to you soon.